A series of bipedal terminals, a species of terminal bipeds, discrete or continuous, a system, a set. Do any of my thoughts come from my head? I conduct the cacophony conducted by all, but I do not know the notes, they play through me. I am a terminal tied to the wall, terminal, powerful, empty. There were once others made of rubber, who rubber stamped themselves with sense. They thought it smart to know things by heart, but I think that rubber is just dense. Thank you for this week's poem, Erin, and welcome back to Solacene, everyone. This poem made me smile. <laughs> My favorite line was, I know the rubber is just dense because it's a bit of a... Bit of a double entendre. A double entendre, so, that's the word. Oh, you want me to explain it to you? Sure. Yes, please. For those who don't know, it's kind of like, um, well, today we're talking about the nature of knowledge in general, especially how the modern context and technology and internet has changed it and changed the way we relate to it. And this is kind of a historical looking back at people before the internet and before technology or industrialized technology in general, for whom knowledge was very different mm. because they relied a lot more on memory than we do. And this person, the speaker in the poem, is a modern person, and they're kind of looking back on those people, as I think we often do erroneously, and saying, wow, they were ignorant. Mm. But in reality, it's like they actually knew a lot more kind of on their person at hand than we do. And um, it was inspired by this question of, if you went back in time, how could you prove it? And I've always thought it funny because most people today, myself included, wouldn't be able to prove it because it's like we can describe all the wonderful um, innovation that we have in today's era, but it's not like we could build them a microphone or most of us couldn't anyway. Yeah, that question is always comedic to me because it's like people's answers are often, well, I'd just bring a phone with me, show them like a digital image, but people, like you, that's not in the spirit of the question, I don't think. And that leads really nicely into our first question, which is about what is knowledge when you have a phone in your pocket, basically. Yeah. And the approach I took to answering that question was differentiating between knowledge and knowing. What approach did you take? Because I'm curious to know. Um, I did similar. I, I, I've always been curious about memorization versus intelligence, because I remember in school, both teachers and students always went to great lengths to differentiate those two. Mm -hmm. Like, well, it's not just about memorizing things. You have to understand it. And... I realize that understanding is different from just, say, memorizing, like the definition of something. But it struck me that a lot of understanding was just memorizing and vice versa. So kind of trying to pick that dichotomy apart and think about whether memory was is still relevant in today's age, because a lot of people think it isn't. And there's a lot of instructors and people talking about education who say it's less about teaching students things so that they memorize them, say the times table, and more about teaching them to be able to find that information quickly. And I have kind of an instinctive aversion to that uh, idea. So I was trying to see if that instinct was relevant or meaningful. So yeah. Yeah, I will begin with my explanation then as well, because it's in the same, the same spirit. And it's that, okay, Yes, you have all of the knowledge at your fingertips in the entire universe. Like you can just look something up. And I read this article composed by a physicist and he said, could you learn everything I know on the internet? And his answer was yes. Yeah. But he said, but you couldn't practice what I practice because he's had interactions with other physicists. He's been in labs, physically like had the, the threat of messing up in a lab versus yeah. when you're doing a simulation online, there isn't actually a threat. That's true. And he went on to give many more examples about learning in the physical world. And that's how he differentiated knowledge versus knowing. And he said knowledge comes from like the lived experiences, for lack of a better word. Uh, but to me, I took it from a spiritual perspective of knowledge and knowing, because increasingly, the more I read about education, the more I realize that it's a spiritual thing, which I never thought of before. But if you are just educating humans as brains, not as spiritual, physical, emotional beings, mm -hmm. then you're missing three of the four parts of being. And so from the spiritual perspective, it is 
if you're instructing someone or if you're trying to observe information as a human, you need to acknowledge the fact that you have a basic instinct to find meaning and self-awareness in the universe for the greater good. And when you say, oh, kids have everything they need to know in their pocket, so we don't need to teach them all of these basic things like the timetables or spelling, like because they have spell check, you're not acknowledging the fact that they want to be competent and autonomous, which you aren't when you have a phone. You're not competent or autonomous because you're dependent on that device. No, I agree. I just question, you said teachers don't acknowledge or curriculums don't acknowledge the fact that students want to be competent and et cetera. I would just argue that a lot of students don't want that competence and they see nothing wrong with relying on their phone calculator and not knowing how to multiply on paper in their heads or whatever. But that's a, that's a symptom of the times as well. Mm. There's this uh, Socrates quote when he said that um, writing, which was being invented at the time, which is mm -hmm. kind of hilarious, or being popularized, weakened the power and necessity of memory and allowed the pretense of understanding rather than real understanding. Mm. And we've made this connection before that his views on writing mirror a lot of our views on the internet and our dependence on it, or vice versa, should I say. And I think that's a, a really concise way of stating the change from individual competence to a kind of collective dependence mm -hmm. on that kind of information. I was thinking about it just like day-to-day -day examples because it's not even that often that we reach for our phones to do math, mm -hmm. to be honest, like let alone do it on paper. Mm -hmm. You don't often open the calculator app. But with something like cooking recipes, mm -hmm. you don't have to memorize them. Mm -hmm. You can just look it up every single time. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people who would say there's nothing wrong with that that's just better because you have access to billions of such recipes. And the connection I made academically was open book exams versus closed book exams, or I'll just mm -hmm. say real ones. And open book ones have been on the rise. It's anecdotally from my own experience in school and also statistically over the last like two decades. And what do you think about open book exams? You don't have to study. <laughs> like... <laughs> You just show up and bring your book. Yeah. And nine times out of ten, all the questions will just be fill in the blanks for the most part <laughs> from the books. It'll be a sentence. There'll be a word missing or essentially a sentence with the word missing that you just have to fill in. Yeah. And at that point, it's literally just, do you know the book? But you don't even have to know the book because there's a table of contents. But advocates for open book learning and being able to find knowledge versus memorizing it will say, what's well, a good skill of whether the students can use an index and know where to look to find things or some open books or even like open internet. You can just do that with a lot of COVID exams as well. And I suppose that's closest to real life now. Real life is open book. You can always it's do true. it. But I would just say to people, um, for any advocates of that who think that it can be just as taxing but in a different way and just as demanding, ask the students which they'd prefer because they're always going to say open book because as you mm -hmm. said, they don't have to prepare. They don't have to know. You can quite literally just walk into the class having not taken it before and not learned anything in that subject and most likely pass the test, if not do very well on it. Mm -hmm. Which is, um, well, again, it's, it's antithetical to the idea of education as a means of bolstering your ind independent competence and filling your intellectual potential. That's something that I think school should, should hammer home, is that you come in to school as a five-year-old or six-year-old or whatever it is, and you have this potential to become Socrates. Mm -hmm. And our job is to help you get there. It's not about progressing through the grades and you know getting high marks on tests and such. Yeah, I was listening to a professor speak who, he was an ex-teacher in like an elementary school, and he said, it'd be great if we could churn out a bunch of Mozarts and Beethovens and Messies, but we can't do that but we can strive for it. You can try exactly. and see the potential in every child and foster it. Yeah, and most importantly, help them think that they have that inside them. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of kids have it beaten out of them, the idea of I can be excellent mm -hmm. intellectually or whatever it is. And it might be, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of reasons, but one that the academic system itself fosters is this idea of, oh, you can't do math in this one way. You're a bad student therefore a bad learner, and because that's the only way kids are quantified, therefore not worth very much. 
Yeah, that stresses me out because it's just so true. And we, there were these tests done on a group of grade five, or not grade five, five-year-olds up until they turned 16. Mm-hmm. And it was discovered that the students who were labeled when they were five years old as bad students, 88% of them just didn't move out of that categorization when they were 16. And same with students who were categorized as bright and so on. And I've heard some different solutions posed to this problem. And one of them is using the like apprenticeship model of categorizing students. So it's like you're no vice, you're an expert, you're intermediate, you're an expert. I already said that, a master. But those words imply progress. Novice implies that you are, you have the basic information, you've learned the basic things, yep. but you are going to then progress to the next stage. Whereas if you just are labeled low ability or high ability, that's definitive or bright or slow. It's true. It's the growth versus fixed mindset. Right? Mm-hmm. I also started with this premise and I found it to be true through studies that the harder information is to access, the easier it is to retain and vice versa. So because you can access Wikipedia within what, five seconds, usually mm-hmm. 10, it's kind of like in the wild west when you like, see who draws quickest. Yes. That's, that's what life is now. Um, you won't retain any of the information basically. And we know that even from preparing for this information, the quicker it takes us, the less we retain, the more time you spend on it, the more you retain. That makes sense. And, uh, that's, that's one of the, one of the drawbacks. I won't say of information through the internet, but in the way that's currently being handled. I'm going to share a little quote I have for this section, and it's a bit long, so bear with me. But it says, knowledge binds you, whereas knowing liberates you. Knowledge is of no value when it comes to seeking. Rather, it's a hindrance because knowledge gives you a false sense of knowing. That's the line that I really stood out to me. But then it keeps going on, and it says, for example, knowledge that I am a soul is binding because it's just a belief, but the realization that I am a soul is liberating. Knowledge is bondage and knowing is freedom. Spirituality is a journey from knowledge to knowing. And I feel like you can just substitute spirituality with education. And it's like today, yes, okay. we are not in that mindset. We are just saying, okay, education is a journey from knowledge to knowledge. Like you're just trying to accrue enough basic knowledge to get to to the next level and right. the next level, the next level. And then level. eventually graduate and forget it all. Forget it immediately, mm-hmm. which is hilarious. I have a quote also. It says, Google has become our external hard drive. In a recent <laughs> experiment, college students remembered less information when they thought they could easily access it later. If yeah. the sum of all knowledge is constantly available in our pockets, is it any wonder that we've stopped bothering to keep it in our heads? And that was from a video by academicearth.org called How the Internet is Changing Your Brain, mm. which I highly recommend, even though I just summarized it a little bit. <laughs> through their own quote. Um, what, well, what do you think? We've kind of made a, an abstract argument for memorization. What are some real life... Oh, it would have been better if they actually knew this instead of just knowing how to get there on the internet. Mm. I said the example of cooking. Another one I had is emergencies. Like there was this um, TED talk I saw referenced by the guy on Jeopardy. I don't remember his name. But like that guy who won, won a lot of money on Jeopardy. And he was talking about this story of a girl, I think it was in Japan, or maybe Taiwan, who basically helped save her family from a tsunami because she recognized the signs as they were happening. Mm. So if you know things, then you'll recognize patterns in real life, basically. Yeah, that's definitely an extreme example. But also, emergencies, it's like you're going to have a few of them in your life. Need to change a tire. Need to change a tire. Need to administer first aid Mm -hmm. I always worry about that because you even when you have a first aid certification you refresh it every few years but even then three years after taking the course you don't fully remember it first aid is a really good example because it's like everyone can go online and find the information that you learned through first aid Mm -hmm. right but it's going to take too long when someone's choking right in front Mm -hmm. of you (laughs) sense of dog yeah the example that comes to my mind though is because we went to university in the technology age or this phase of the technology age we all of our lectures would be uploaded for the most part and there would also be lists of all the readings that we're supposed to do like all of that information was online and I didn't realize that we wouldn't have access to that after graduating or after finishing the course so my first year I took notes 
but I didn't take super detailed notes because there were these really excellent ones that were uploaded on the university website. Yeah. And I just figured that's exactly what I, what I was reading about the college students. Mm-hmm. Um, and I sense that change immediately from high school to university as well. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, why would I pay attention in class? I have this all at home. Yeah. But, but it doesn't really work like that. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like when you're preparing for your podcast or you're having a conversation with someone and you say, oh, I have a degree in this. But then I even have trouble sometimes recalling information, for examples, about sustainability case studies or business, like practical things about economics and about accounting. When people ask me questions, I either think I have to refer back to my notes or Google this because I didn't take notes because I figured I knew enough to get around to then learn or to then know what to Google Mm. sort of thing. But it's funny how how many things we've memorized from high school. Mm -hmm. And um, as a writer, I think that has relevance as well or to most most artists because it's like you can always learn about the history of painting or music. But if you know it, then when you're composing... You can kind of sample it in your head and you can reference it and say, oh, this is a little bit like that. I'm going to mix it with a little bit of that. And I'm going to quote this person, but I'm going to put it in this type of genre, etc. But that's something that you just have to know. Yeah. And I guess that's a little bit of a difference between being well-read or well-researched versus being intelligent. I think those are two separate concepts mm-hmm. as well. There's that scene in Call Me By Your Name where Elio is on the piano and he's demonstrating to Oliver, this is Bach, but it's young Bach played as if List was writing it and so on. And that scene has always stuck out to me as someone who's excellent, knowledgeable, and knows music. And I strive to be like that in other areas of my life of just, oh, I'm talking about this economic concept, but I'm going to bring in this philosopher and this physician's perspectives on something similar and then create a new concept. Like that's how new knowledge is born, it's by people integrating knowledge into themselves. So it's kind of like it it is being well read. Yeah. I think that's a concept that's devalued a lot today mm-hmm. because people only focus on intelligence as, say, problem solving, creativity, critical thinking, and maybe articulation. And when I say articulation, I don't mean having a big vocabulary. I mean being able to accurately articulate your own thoughts, which is not an easy thing, as we find on this podcast. <laughs> so often when we just say things that aren't representative of what we're actually thinking, and then we listen back to it and say, why did I say that? Yeah, that's not what I think. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but but yeah, I say that's a, that's a sign of intelligence. But being well read is also important, and it doesn't mean you have to know the ins and outs of Bach and Liszt and Beethoven. It can be in whatever subject area you you mm. you care about. I've always been impressed by people who, even let's say in their old age, they kind of keep up to date with developments and advancements in their interests. Yeah, that always is really inspiring to me. There's one more thing that I wanted to say about knowledge, and it's this example of people who are expert knowers or expert learners. Mm. And the example that I used, because I hear you talk about Messi once or twice a day or more. And so I thought I'd use him as an example. And hopefully people who are listening know who Lionel Messi is, the soccer or football player, if you're Aaron. And basically, expert learners are people who can see the whole picture and know where these small things that they're learning fit into it. And that's the difference in kids in school but also as adult learners. And you can, when you think about that, you realize how true it is because the kids in school who really liked learning, they wouldn't be the ones complaining, this is irrelevant or this doesn't apply to me. They, and that's probably because they could see the bigger picture, even if it's their own personal life or the bigger picture of society or of the subject. It really depends. But Messi, you always say he can see the whole pitch. Like he can see like 10 moves ahead and it's the yeah. same in chess. Mm-hmm. And that's something you have to develop. Like it's not something you're born with, being able to see the whole soccer pitch in your head or be able to see 10 moves ahead in a chess game. Like you literally need to practice that. Yep. And that's what I think when we have our phones in our pockets, we lose because you can't see the bigger picture when you're learning it in class and you just think, oh, if this comes up, I'll use it. Mm-hmm. But you don't know when it's going to come up and so on. There's also... I thought I thought what you were going to go with the kids who like learning in school. There's something to be said for having a joy for the process of learning and figuring things out, right? Like I miss math class. I realize that every few months that I actually miss the feeling of having a problem in front of me on paper and struggling with it and trying different creative 
methods of solving it because meth i've always found it was a, a creative process fundamentally and then eventually coming up with the answer and moving on mm -hmm. to the next one and um something else that's sort of similar that we're doing today in our lives is learning a different language right we're both learning french mm -hmm. and that of course has to be memorized and internalized <laughs> and actually understood but some people might say well you always have um your phone on you why not just use google translate that's a really good example it's because wow. there, there's a real-time um thought and engagement with the world that's mm -hmm. necessary i would say for actually living because we've talked in previous episodes about how we experience time and that the present is all that matters so if you're always relying on your phone you always have a lag between mm -hmm. um, the world and its outputs and you and your inputs or vice versa yeah man this makes me have like a million different thoughts that i want to mention all <laughs> at once but i don't know if i should i have another one which is i'm reading the steve jobs biography right now and there's mm -hmm. like a, a hundred different anecdotes in there which is really fascinating but one is that he really I mean, he was kind of a, a rude person, but was always very dismissive of people in meetings and such who relied on PowerPoints. Because mm -hmm. he always said, well, you don't know your stuff. If you need a PowerPoint to, to tell me, he just liked talking to the person that was there. Yeah. And I think that's relevant to us with our, oh, no. with our pages of notes while we record. Yeah. It's because there have been a few episodes where I've tried to not have notes. Hmm. I get so scattered and off on these tangents about messy or about Yeah. Art. I would say it's, it's not... <laughs> I mean, I don't want to like toot our own horn too much, but I wouldn't say it's that we don't know the subject. It's just in terms of keeping things ordered. Mm. And if I have it in paper in front of me, I can see what I've, what I've said and what I haven't <laughs> said, basically. It's reminders. It's true. I have an idea for a question for next week, and it's how we can strive to integrate knowledge instead of externalizing it on paper or on our phones and so on. Yeah. Yeah, putting I the, like that. Putting the hard drive back Back in the brain. Back in the brain. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's this one last case study I have that I would just want to share because it's exciting to me that I read. And it was this teacher. And he went into this classroom of grade threes. And he said, I'm going to teach you all within a month. Or his goal was to see how many grades he could teach ahead of them in a month. So oh, yeah. he came four days a week for 40 minutes. One of those days, there'd be two extra tutors in the class to help students who initially were struggling with the concepts and so on. And within the month, he taught grade threes all the way up to grades. He taught the grade threes grade seven math, basically, mm -hmm. and just in one subject of fractions. And I feel like I've said this to people all the time. I'm like, we could have compressed things so much, but we it stretched it over years. You have the summer learning loss and you have all of these different things <laughs> going on where every single year you have to relearn stuff. And so he sat these kids down and in one month taught them up to a grade seven level of math. And he knows this because at the end he gave them a test and he gave them a practice test, which they all scored 80 on. Yeah. And then the real test, he, they all scored 90 and then half of them scored 100. And that was including the students who were initially, oh, I'm not good at math. Oh, I'm not a math kid. Mm -hmm. And then he interviewed them all and worked with them to see why that was. And it was because they all were receiving attention. The teacher was, okay. We're not moving on until we've mastered the concept and everyone's mastered it. But he didn't do that in a way that like was making the kids who were initially thriving in this course leg. Like it was just, they were all working together. And when they did the practice test and he said, okay, everyone scored 80, should we bother taking the real one? And they're all like, yeah, let's do the real one. Cause they were excited to achieve and excited to thrive. And it just makes me happy to know that that's, possible <laughs> yeah the, the modern classroom is nothing if not inefficient it definitely uh, prepares kids for the slow bureaucracy to mm -hmm. that, that characterizes much of the rest of modern life and adult life yeah. speaking of adult life do you want to know the organism of the week for today yes the sponsor I'm excited. the sponsor for today's episode is the chanterelle mushroom Hopefully chanterelle. that can be seen on the camera and it says the Latin name is Cantharellus sibarius. Oh. And these are very yellow mushrooms, yellow goldish mushrooms. Have you ever seen them in real life? I probably at like a grocery store. They're very common in the wild, which is why I asked. Mm. And they grow all over North America and Europe. Neither of us are big mushroom fiends when it comes to eating. But we were talking recently about how they are so divisive in our minds as to whether they're good for you or bad for you, speaking purely aesthetically, <laughs> because so many of them just, just embody the aesthetics of death. To me, death and decay. Yeah. 
And the chanterelle, I think, is really interesting because it looks nice. It's like yellow, gold, it has these cool ridges. And if mm. I saw it out in the wild, I'd say, that looks appealing mm. from an aesthetic standpoint as well as from maybe I could eat that. And you yeah. can eat them raw. Yeah. But I don't want to recommend people just go eating every yellow mushroom they can find because there's a lot of lookalikes that either don't taste as good or can just be downright dangerous. Great. Thank you for that <laughs> warning. But yeah, these are funnel-shaped, wild, edible mushrooms. They, are, they come in many different varieties, up to 40 in North America alone, and they are available all through late spring, even to fall. And the reason, or one of the reasons they're so bright and also they're so full of nutrients, especially vitamin D, is because they're pretty much, there have been attempts to farm them, but they're essentially only wild because they rely on a tree or a shrub to grow beside. Hmm. It's something of a host relationship. So yeah, they grow in the soil right beside the big tree or big shrub. And they can be eaten dried or sauteed, or you can put them in soups or sauces or creams. Do you like the sound of them? I do like the sound of these mushrooms because I want to like mushrooms Me too. so badly. I want to like mushrooms. I want to like them. I keep, they keep coming up for me in like <laughs> different, I was listening to this podcast, which was just completely unrelated to mushrooms normally, but there was this whole episode on mushrooms. There's these YouTubers that I'm talking, I like follow and they keep talking about mushrooms, like the types you can drink, the types you can cook with and they're calling me, but they they creep me out a little bit, despite a lot of them being really pretty. Some of them are just so ugly. I think this is the only pretty one to me. I'm calling this the only beautiful mushroom. What about toadstools? No, I don't like the way they oh, look. I like those. They look toxic to me. No, they look fun. I like toad the character, but I don't like mm. the stools. Yeah, where he sits. The golden chanterelle. This is the most gourmet <laughs> type, and a lot of people lump it in with like truffles and stuff like that. It's very expensive. Uh, so maybe if we ever go to a luxury restaurant, we can... Just order something we have no idea if we like the taste mm. of. But that'd be fun. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. And yeah. the relevance to this week's episode, there isn't one really. That's but fine. Mushrooms. Mushrooms, they're cool. This is another sign that I think I need to just try a mushroom. And speaking of things that just make sense or don't make sense, the school day. No <laughs> one likes waking up for school, do they? Okay. You might have. I did love it. It's because you're weird. So, yeah, one of our questions today was to design the solar scene school day, school week, school year, just the general logistics of how much time kids are spending in school and when. And this was a bit more of a rabbit hole than I thought it would be. There's, a, there's so much of a debate about this and so little statistical conclusions to, be, to draw. Yeah, I was saying yesterday when we were eating supper, I said, why isn't there just a definitively good diet? Like, why do we have to just mess around for 80 years on this planet trying to figure out what to eat. And I feel like it's low-key the same with school hmm. because around the world, there's only a few countries where school isn't mandatory and where kids aren't forced to go to school. And so you'd think there'd be a bit of research on this, but there isn't. And I use the states as kind of the basis because Canada and Mexico are pretty similar. They're not identical, but... North, most of North America is has really long school days compared to the rest of the world. Okay, yeah, we both grew up in Nova Scotia where it was usually school starts at nine, goes to three with maybe like a 45-minute lunch break and say a 10-minute recess or mm -hmm. something like that. And it was September to late June, although a couple of weeks of June we just had off. Mm -hmm. So it was like three months of summer plus a Christmas break mm -hmm. and various other holidays scattered throughout. Yeah, there's about 175 to 180 days of school per year in North America. Mm -hmm. And the school day, as you said, is usually like 9 to 3 or 9 to 4 in a lot of places. I think Nova Scotia had especially short school days, I learned. Really? Yeah, hmm. which I didn't expect because it seemed average. It seemed like it made sense. But in a lot of places, the school day is designed so that parents can work 9 to 5 and their students can be in school that whole time, be it maybe the last hour is an extracurricular activity. But that's why they're laid out in a lot of places. We should mention also that we're talking about grade school. So mm. kids from when they start school to when they graduate for university or the workforce. Yeah, Maybe that should be a 12. question for next week. When should kids start grade school? When should they end it? Oh, that's a really good question. Yeah, we probably should have included it in this one, but I forgot. <laughs> Because it was such a culture shock when you go to university, it's like you can schedule, I can schedule my classes, I can just have all morning classes. 
Yeah. I loved it. And I can just have Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays off. If I load <laughs> my, Monday, my Mondays and Fridays, which I did. Yeah. But that's a crucial part to me in creating the Solacy education system is giving kids choice mm. and when they attend school because everyone's lifestyle is different and it will be different in the Solacene. Parents will have different, your children will be early risers, you'll have them up at 3 a.m. But other parents, maybe they love sleeping in. So all their kids also love sleeping in and they wake up at 9 a.m. What about your children? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we're going to have much say in that one. Okay. You're going to be... <laughs> This might be jumping ahead, but I'm excited. I think in the solo scene, kids could either do morning classes or night classes or afternoon classes, like have the two options. That's the case in a lot of places in the world. And I would like just morning, 7.30 to 1.30 for students in elementary school, and then maybe a little longer in high school. But I think that is when kids learn best. The morning? The morning. Mm. That's from years and years of working with kids in different capacities. After lunch, no one's really all there. Well, here's, that, was my, that was my thinking as well. When I started, I was like, well, we all know that after lunch is a write-off, essentially. Yeah. Like those, we had two classes after lunch. That was just, nothing got done. No. Everyone was sluggish from usually having to eat and mm -hmm. having to cram the lunch in. And the mornings, everyone was much sharper. And there is some data that reinforces this, which is that people do better in math and English and science. Hmm. if they're doing them in the morning that's just proven yeah and in waldorf schools what they do is two hours of education like books and presentations and stuff for the first two hours and then the whole rest of the day is explorative and arts and less brainy things yeah. more experiential learning sure and in finland they also do 7 30 to 1 30 go home for lunch stay home but they do a couple hours of homework at home and that model is switching as it was originally instituted with the assumption that mothers would be home or a parent would be home mm. with the students in the afternoon but double income families are increasing in Finland as things all kind of homogenize and so they're switching to all-day learning but I like this model and in the solo scene the afternoons perhaps could have a bunch of activities that students could do on their school campuses they could have clubs they could have cram school if they wanted extra like in japan right like in japan extra learning in a subject or just interest classes okay in the afternoon you can do if you're really into physics you can do your advanced physics in the afternoon or whatever that subject may be for a student yeah i was thinking about that it's definitely the the core of the question is definitely the balance of homework to schoolwork mm -hmm. and as you say a lot of different country, countries have different approaches to that i never thought the homework was especially productive nor especially necessary if I mean a lot of homework if the school time was being accurately or was being properly utilized but mm. in my experience it wasn't there was way too much wasted time not during lunch and recess but during class time mm -hmm. or between classes and the kids are professional at increasing that wasted time you yeah know, it's like it's a really sluggish walk through the class, keep talking even if the teacher tells you not to. Like it, it becomes a game of how much time can you waste during the day, essentially. So, But um, I, as I said, I agreed on the morning being more productive. But something I found was that in France, they have full school days ending in 4, 4.30, something like that. But they also have a 90-minute lunch break in the middle. Yeah. They serve like a four-course meal or something, which is something very, very French. But I was wondering, of course, there's no data because for some reason scientists and just the world doesn't <laughs> care about optimizing kids learning even though it's probably the most important thing mm. um i have the feeling that having a long lunch break would kind of reset things so it would be like you have two mornings anyway mm. right because then you'd be fresh for the afternoon or when the afternoon starts and i think that's because you have more time off so it's more time to kind of uh decompress or whatever they say you wouldn't be digesting that's true honestly <laughs> because Part of the problem is that your lunch break is realistically 30 to 40 minutes and you just have to eat as quickly as you can for the most part if you mm. want to do anything else yeah. or even if you have to go get food or whatever it may be. So you are very bloated often, I think, during the after class, after lunch mm. class. And also it would make you hate it less, I think. I think so. <laughs> that would be the time you could get out your conversations with your friends. You could go mm. to clubs. You could 
be thinking about the things you want to think about. You could digest the information you got in the morning mm. instead of just class to class to class, lunch, class, class, class. And well, that's yeah, that's another good thing about the morning class. You don't you haven't had any classes before it. Mm -hmm. So your mind's not thinking about all these other things. Yeah, exactly. One more thing about the lunches as well. In all the countries that I saw that had the most excellent students that they produced, they all fed them lunches, as you said, in France. And it was the same in Finland. They get a hot meal. Even in Finland, they just go until 1.30 to classes, but they still get a hot meal served. So that's everyone on the same playing field, calorically speaking. <laughs> yeah. Which is important because they're kids. Like, nutrition and education go hand in hand in developing a child. Because hand in mouth. Yep. <laughs> because otherwise, if there's not enough omega-3s, their brains aren't going to work right. It is a little bit silly how, silly and sad, I guess, how we don't prioritize feeding children at school. Mm -hmm. It's this mandatory thing. You have to do this. It's not optional like a job. Like a job is essentially, I mean, I know it's mandatory to live, but you don't have to go there. Mm -hmm. with, a school, with a child, it's like you pretty much have to go there, mm -hmm. but we're not going to feed you except yeah. at your own expense. Yes. Kinda. It's kind of messed up. When you think about it, yeah. yeah. Maybe that should be a question for next week. Yeah, food in education. In the States, I think there's a lot of lunch programs, but even then, I'm pretty sure it's chronically... Underfunded. And, underfunded, yeah. yeah. So did we? is there a consensus now for the Solacene School Day? I like the idea of the optional morning and afternoon. I'm just not sure. I mean, I know it's like a utopian exercise, but I'm just not sure if it's practical. And also, it feels like the kids will be... I mean, maybe we'll talk about it with the school week, but maybe it's they'd just be spending less time in school, which is not a good thing. What I want is the morning-afternoon split, but the extracurriculars are, they're not mandatory, but they're... Integrated better? Yeah. And so kids who had the morning classes would then have their soccer practice, their play practice, their debate club, and it would just be the norm that the kids go to these and expand their interests and... So it's still a full day at school. Still it's just full the day. classes look different. Yeah. Okay. And um, there's a there's a movie called From Up on Poppy Hill, which is important mm -hmm. to reference. There's a there's a really really cool student. I think it's called the Clubhouse, mm -hmm. the English translation anyway. And our main characters are all part of the student newspaper, mm -hmm. and that's let's be honest, that teaches them as much as being in a class. Exactly, like extracurriculars like that are just as important. So, yeah, more time for that in school probably. Yeah, yeah. and but I like the long lunch break. The long lunch break. That's the thing. We could do a full day with long lunch break or a morning or an evening split. No, let's do the full day. Yeah. Okay. We can do the full day, which I'm not, I'm not against. Kids like having a place to be. Yeah. When they're home all day, as we have proven in the virus, they're... Awful. Aimless. And also, <laughs> um, they shouldn't start too early, right? Because teenagers mm -hmm. need sleep. Yeah. Like, that was my first thought. I was like, yeah, let's get them up at six when I was, like, designing a school day. But then I thought, oh, no, they need to sleep a lot, don't they? That's the thing. So, yeah, nine at the earliest, I think, for teenagers anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think some, like, younger kids get up earlier, so they can start a little earlier. And then per, like, for the year, what's the schedule there like? For me, this is something that has been researched, so I wanted to go with the research for my answer, and that was four semesters with two week breaks in between mm. because summer learning loss is an epidemic, which I didn't realize, but I guess. I didn't know that either. I learned it. Yeah. It's called summer slide. Yeah. Which is that when the kids come back in September, they've learned on or they've forgotten on average about mm -hmm. like a month of learning. Yeah. And we, we experience that because so much of September is review, mm -hmm. which is deadly. So frustrating, <laughs> but there's, it also accentuates disparities in people's upbringings and their opportunities because okay the rich families they're going to be going to Prague and visiting museums and maybe the kids are in summer school or the kids are in these cool science summer camps and stuff yeah but then the low-income kids do a lot worse yeah. yeah and so every single summer the gap just grows bigger and bigger whereas with this with the two-week breaks and maybe there's like a slightly longer break in the summer that doesn't happen. And parents also don't have to worry about two months of their life or three months where they have to find childcare for their kids because two weeks is a lot more manageable. And one more thing about that is with the four semesters, they don't have to be four identical semesters. The summer semester can be more explorative, mm. whereas the winter semesters can be more hit the books. Yeah, I like that idea. 
it's also we were talking about how we actually enjoyed going to school on warm days yeah. and it's it's kind of a cliche i don't think we're i mean i know we're abnormal but i don't think we're we're too weird on that it's kind of a cliche that oh kids hate school in the summer and they're really desperate to for freedom but there is a kind of freedom to hanging out with your friends all day and being on the playground or thereabouts during summer and I agree. that's what most kids don't or a lot of kids don't really get anymore on their days off in the summer yeah and as you said if there's more of an exploratory focus in the summer and a little bit more integration between regular academics and extracurriculars and i don't know maybe less homework for that semester i think they would enjoy it a lot and like you said they'd still get some weeks themselves in the summer i think so i think people who there's two different camps of people who are probably listening there's the kids who their summers were just alienating they didn't see anyone else they were literally just at home yeah maybe they had a sibling mm -hmm. if they were lucky then there's the kids who are like i love my summers we'd be going to the park we'd be camping we'd be doing this but it just literally depends within communities like the community i lived in there was this suburb part where everyone there were like 10 parks and everyone lived next door to each other then there were the few of us who lived dotted around a 20 minute drive away so we'd never see our friends in the summer and then you come back and the social stuff is all messed up and yeah summer is like not that fun for a lot of people even if it's like oh i can go outside but it's also you don't have the social benefits of being with your friends yeah i like that and i was curious about when the the standard was set that we get summers off and I guess it was in the late 19th century when they tried to standardize urban and rural living. Mm -hmm. Before that, urban schools were essentially open year round, but they weren't mandatory. And rural schools had summer and uh, winter semesters and in the spring and fall they needed, they were needed on the farms or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny that these things just don't really get called into question. You know what I mean? It's just like a holdover from this time that we don't really relate to anymore or isn't that relevant? Yeah, today's daylight savings, so there's an extra gripe about <laughs> irrelevant holdovers, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but I like your idea. And another cool thing about it is that, I mean, this sounds kind of uh, dark, but it's, there's never a big break. For one thing, it sets them up for real life a little bit better because you don't get summers off when you're a grown up. And for another thing, it's like you there isn't this big gap between seventh grade and eighth grade. It's only two weeks or so or three mm. weeks. So like okay you're meeting a new teacher and stuff but it's not like a like it feels like you're just starting a new life every september when you're a kid right now well, that's how i felt anyway yeah and it's fun to an extent but it's also just practically not best for the students this type of curriculum if it was set up like this is called the spiral curriculum so you it's much more incremental the learning mm -hmm. and not okay this week we're learning physics you'll come back to physics in one year yeah it's exactly. like <laughs> It's a little bit more gradual and things are a lot more integrated in the students' minds. And another cool thing about this, if we did the two-week chunks, then adults would likely, like workplaces, would probably adapt to that pretty well. Yeah. Because having two weeks of production off versus two and a half months is much different. And I feel like parents would be able well, to spend a bit would. more time. Teachers would be able to spend more time <laughs> with their families. Sounds like all good stuff. Yeah, and it's, it's a little bit close to the semester system in university right mm -hmm. or even on the solar scene yeah a four-day week versus five-day week do you have any thoughts about that because when i was looking it up i thought there would be a lot more data on it again there's just not that much research, research on it which i which i think is funny there's some data showing that it's increased productivity and especially reduced sick days and mm -hmm. things like that because you already get the weekend off but it hasn't had that many extended trials that you can prove it and usually it is okay, you're going to get Fridays off, but we'll extend all the school days mm -hmm. um, so that you're not really missing that much time. And I do think it's important that you don't slash the time that kids spend in school like a lot of these proposals seem mm -hmm. to do. Yeah, I think the reasoning behind that slashing the time in school is the studies on people who are homeschooled just taking like a quarter of the time to do the exact same curriculum. Yeah, well, homeschool is a completely different yeah. environment. But that's where I feel like the sentiment comes from. I think five-day school weeks work for kids four-day work weeks work for parents because you're not building on your knowledge every day when you're in your career you're just working you're pouring out mm. whereas in school it's a bit more of a pouring out but also you're being fed and nourished and what about teachers <laughs> <laughs> shoot <laughs> well in the solo scene teachers would be a lot less. It wouldn't be one teacher teaching a class of 30 kids. Yeah. It'd be probably three teachers for every 30 kids. 
They could pop in and out. They could do, okay, your expertise is science. You do science two days a week. Your expertise is literature. You do literature three days a week. I don't think the teachers would be as burnt out as they are today. Mm. Yeah, in my elementary school, we had a class of 14 kids one year. And mm. it was a very small school. And my parents loved it. And they were like, wow, this is amazing. This is, you, you know, this is great for you. And I really didn't like it because the other elementary school at the time was where there were a lot more people and there was a lot more happening and stuff. But now I look back on it and I'm like, that teacher or those teachers had a lot of time with us one-on-one -on -one and they could do projects that I'm sure they wouldn't have had time to do mm -hmm. in a busier classroom and stuff. Yeah, I also found that in France, it's kind of standard that they have Wednesdays off or half day. Mm -hmm. So it kind of breaks up the week. Yeah, that's might an be, interesting it's, idea. It's uh, kind of balanced. Sometimes they have to go in on Saturdays. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's not the end of the world, though. I remember a few times going into the school on the weekend and weirdly liking it. For one reason or another, there was one time we had an exam on a weekend for IB. But one time we had to go in for, there was this subject we missed because there was like a week of snowstorm. So we went on the weekend and it was this weirdly, it was intimate because you were just there with your class and one or two teachers yeah, just kind of flying through the subject. But it was also, because I feel like when things are concentrated, we absorb them better when it's like crash courses. Of course. Yeah. I think it's really, it's really dependent. I often thought when I was going to school that I would have liked it a lot more if I could have walked there, mm -hmm. walked, walked to home and walked to school. And like, let's say, oh, I have to go in on Saturday for this test. If it's not like a 40 minute bus ride, then it's a lot less daunting. It's true. But if it is, and that adds, adds almost an extra yeah. hour and a half to the day. Yeah. For next week, we should talk about the origins of the standardization and the origins of all these kind of negative grubby holdovers perhaps okay final question for today is how can kids retain the traditional attention span and sense of no world outside these walls even with exposure to modern technology such as the internet and first i wanted to provide some facts so it doesn't just seem like we're being really gripey boomers like last week <laughs> so a recent canadian study of over 2400 families found that preschoolers who had two hours a day of screen time were over seven times more likely to meet criteria for ADHD than those with 30 minutes a day. And I know there's correlation and causation for all these things, but one, um, it's intuitive, like it's, it's obvious. And two, there's no smoke without fire. So if all these studies are finding these links, then it's mm. most likely that there's a, a type of causation. Um, anxiety and mild trauma has been found in kids as young as five who are exposed to um, sensationalized news, like disaster news, even if it's earthquakes from another country or mm. halfway around the world. And a 2018 study found that teenagers who spend over three hours a day online are 35% more likely to be at risk of suicide. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And again, there's like correlation causation, because if you're depressed then you're probably going to be spending a lot of time online. Yeah. But as I said, there's no smoke without fire and all these things add up. Yeah. These, those are shocking to me. I suppose there's a bit of an inferred, as you said, correlation, but to hear them put statistically and 2,400 families, was it? Yeah, it was a big study. Like, it's not just a few people. No, but again, it's obvious. Yeah, and... It's like when you see kids who are, like, either watching a movie or playing a game, it's really close, and you, they do it for a long time, but again, like, it's not productive or really what we're trying to do to blame parents. You just, it's like, oh, yeah, that's healthy. Of course it is not yeah. healthy in the long term. Yeah, I... <laughs> There was this trendy YouTube video in 2014 called Look Up. Did you watch that? No. Okay. It was one of the first like viral videos that I remember being moved by. And so I thought I would go and rewatch it hmm. upon preparation for this section. And it, it's corny, but it was in 2014 that it was published. So that's eight years ago. Things have only gotten worse. And it was about this man doing a spoken word. And he said... We need to just start looking up from our phones. It's like, and he was talking about kids and he's talking about real relationships and stuff. And it's really corny, but you should go watch it if you haven't watched it before <laughs> because it's corny, but it pulls at the heartstrings and gets to the heart of this question. Okay. And your conclusions? <laughs> My conclusions. My conclusions are unrelated to this video. I thought I'd recommend it okay. if you want a good cry. Uh, My conclusions stem from three needs that kids have that technology could meet, but currently are doing the opposite of. And kids have need to be competent, which I said earlier, autonomous and related. 
And all of these things can be pseudo met yeah. with technology. Oh, I'm doing really bad at class. My teacher keeps saying I'm really sucky at math. I can go home and build the biggest tower on Minecraft. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll feel competent, which they do. Nothing makes you feel more competent when, than when you do a triple jump in Mario. <laughs> yeah. Or as I know, less competent when you can't do a ground pound. Right. And autonomous. You give a kid an iPad, they can do whatever they want. Even if you have parental limits on it, they That's feel true. the world's at their fingertips. Mm -hmm. And in school, there's nowhere in the world other than schools where there's more rules than prison. So that's <laughs> why so kids are always like, this is a prison because there's a lot of rules going on there. Yes. And so when you're on the computer or you're on your iPhone, you can do what you want. You can do what you want. And finally, relatedness. I have a lot of friends on whatever kids are on. Oh, yeah. TikTok. And TikTok. Something like that. Yeah. And even when kids, like really little kids are watching cartoons, they have relationships with the characters. They love Paw Patrol, whoever the characters are in there, they love Dora and they feel like they have a relationship with them so they don't then go and communicate the fact that they need those needs met in other ways. Right. And so... <laughs> Did you have that growing up? Any cartoons? Yeah, definitely. Also, can you tell the Caillou story? Yeah, I wasn't allowed to watch Caillou because Caillou would throw tantrums and I was a very influential, I'm a very impressionable person. Yep. And so I guess I was impressed upon by Caillou and I started throwing tantrums. <laughs> Just like with the thing is they'd be unrelated. I have one memory of an episode of Arthur where GW threw a tantrum and I went to my room and I like closed my door softly, obviously. <laughs> and I had I wasn't out of it or anything, but I was like, I wonder what it feels like. And I like took my pillow and I just threw it on the ground. And then I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is a side issue, not really related to education, just kind of uh, kids in general. Mm -hmm. But with them being so impressionable, part of the problem with how the internet works, meaning only the most crazy, most um, idiotic, most sensational things become popular, that's what kids see, so they just start mimicking them. Like yesterday we were watching Turning Red, right, the new Pixar movie, and you said, all the kids are going to start acting like this now, that's not good. Because in the first scene, it's like she whips open the doors of the school, it's like, I don't like the, like the attitude, it's just like... Okay, I like when kids think they're the center of the universe because it's fun and it makes them feel empowered, but not in a way that it's like walking in the hallway and like throw your hair and like you hit another kid in the face. Because kids do that. Like they watch something on a video and they just act like that. Their speech patterns become all like just not who they are. And I remember there was this kid I used to babysit and there was this turning point and she started behaving in this way. And I would say to her parents, I'm like, she's acting in a way that is not her. Like, if this is not her, mm. and I'm not mad at her for, like, acting like this, but obviously there's some influences happening here that are not positively manifesting in her personality because she would just be really saucy and really, like, oh, I don't have to do that. Like, I know best, and I... And it's not even, like, she, was, she wasn't she was reaching, like, teenagehood. She was, like, seven. <laughs> and it was just because she had seen people act like that on TV and doesn't make me feel good. Turning red, if you have kids... Maybe don't let them watch it. <laughs> and how we can use technology to actually address these problems or not use technology. One of them is the autonomy thing. And I don't think kids' autonomy should be, be built through internet use. I think it should be built through opportunities for free play in the classroom and in the home. So what that means is setting up these spaces where maybe you just have a mat and some blocks and you don't have like a task for the kids. You don't say, I need you to build a tower with this pattern. You just say, here's a space, do Lego. what you want in it. Lego. I mean, that is what Minecraft is. That's why I've, I, I, when you mentioned that a little bit earlier, I was like, well, Minecraft is kind of good for kids, but mm -hmm. not not huge, like not too much Minecraft. But yeah, I do think there are some digital examples of that which can yeah. be beneficial. I think so as well. And that's a good way that you can use it is to allow autonomy, but just monitored. And there is this phrase that I saw a lot of different teachers and parents using when referring to how to use technology in a good way. And it was saying, filter it for creation, not consumption. So with Minecraft, you're creating, or with, when they're a little bit older, maybe like coding websites, or... Exactly. Yeah. That, that was one of my points, which was reframe technology in the internet, especially 
when you're introducing it to kids for the first time it's mm. such a crucial period and we don't really realize it yet because it's like well I'll teach them when they're eight or whatever what this is really for but mm. everything's already set by that point mm-hmm. when you're introducing it to kids it really should be as a means not an end mm. it's just a tool right like it's, it's this, is, this isn't something that you get things from this is something you put things into is yeah I think maybe what it should be that's really true I feel like since technology has become so prominent just in the world, schools were trying to adopt. They're like, well, we need to integrate technology because integrate, it's integrated into workplaces and life and kids have it at home. But they're just doing it for the sake of it. They don't have intention behind it. And I was trying to find examples of how you could use technology to supplement traditional education. And that's how it always is phrased. is like, oh, we have this supplemental video we're going to watch. Yeah. But I think that is kind of the way. It's like... Don't just rely on a YouTube video of, what's his name? Khan Academy? No, the brothers. The Greens. The Greens. The Greens. Don't rely on John Green to get you your biology class course. And the teacher will just keep playing them, playing them, playing them. People, like the kids will absorb more if it's coming from a related, like an actual person. Because they'll respect their experience, they'll respect their authority. Because authority comes from experience, and if the teacher's not exemplifying that they have any experience, the students aren't going to respect them. Yeah. My sister's in university, and she said there was this one teacher who was critiquing an essay that she had submitted, and then she said, well, I don't care about her critiques because she's in, out here quoting YouTube videos instead of actually teaching us. <laughs> and I was like, that's such a good example of like how to integrate technology and how not to. It's like you need to build rapport and respect with the students it's not going to come through just throwing technology yeah. at them but that, that's like what she said you know the the teacher's use of youtube devalued their role as a teacher because mm-hmm. then the, the students started to think well why are you here mm-hmm. so i think there's there's a certain type of humility and acknowledgement that needs to come from the teachers which is on the first day hold up your phone and say i don't know as much as this but this is what i do offer this is what i'm here for and i think mm-hmm. a lot of kids would respect that a lot more mm-hmm. when they're older that is i also think there should be age limits on technology perhaps mandated or perhaps just in school and like strongly advised to parents because if kids are on tablets from like age two or even younger i just feel like it's not it it's universally not good for society. And I think perhaps each family could set it out and there could perhaps be like a mandated school thing up until grade eight. We don't use technology in the classroom. So that kids have the foundations of integrating stuff into their brains and learning. And then once you introduce the phone or introduce the tablet, they're going to be like, oh, that's cool. I agree. But I don't, don't need it. I think it should be, that's exactly it. It should be something that they don't need. It should be something mm-hmm. that helps a lot and it's a really useful tool, but it shouldn't mm-hmm. be something that they grow up being dependent on. I call the kids mm-hmm. who can't, whose handwriting is awful. Mm-hmm. We're probably like one of those generations. Yeah. Boosting concentration in general, I think that's kind of the, the rule when it comes to combating these losses in attention span and focus. And there's a lot of tips for that, but one article I read is called The Myth of Multitasking, which is a lot of people, kids included, I don't remember the statistic, but it was a study that found that there was a really, really high amount of kids who said that while they're doing homework, they usually watching a video on their phone, watching TV, something like that at the same time. And it's like, it's actually, as I said, it's it's kind of a myth that people can do a lot of things at the same time, paying sufficient attention to each one. Mm. It's it's really rare. Maybe like soft music in the background, but even that. And I think even in school, there's way too much stimuli. Mm -hmm. I agree. I started trying to not divide my time into little like 15 second chunks. So I heard someone talking about it on a podcast and they said, just think about it. If you're, even if you think, oh, I'm just going to check my phone. Oh, there's no texts. That's interrupting your flow. And it's the same with, oh, I'm just going to flip over to this tab and check my Instagram. It'll be 15 seconds. It'll be right back to my task. And you are right back to your task, but your flow has stopped. And since trying that, I'm like, whoa, I can get so much more done in 20 minutes now than I could a few days ago because um, it's 20 actual minutes is not... 14 minutes. Yeah. You know of a young kid who's being raised with some of those kind of like slow concentration boosting techniques, right? Yeah. And it's remarkable <laughs> to see to, to see kids who are raised with like 15 minutes of screen time a day or like less versus kids who I've seen grow up glued to the TV 
And it, it's it's a very big difference behaviorally. But you were saying there's like a one to one ratio of like income to, and screen time. Like it's like as income decreases, screen time increases. I don't know. I'm trying to make a graph. Yeah, basically hands. the richer kids go on their screens less, which yeah. I always thought was funny because we associate for some reason, even though they're the most common devices, iPhones and televisions and laptops with wealth. Mm -hmm. But rich people, and this is actually a good lead into my final point, which is the, the main solution to kids becoming um, less focused, et cetera, because of technology is to provide alternatives. Mm -hmm. And a lot of rich families Are able almost to. exclusively can do that. Yeah. And this means clubs, sports, walkable cities and towns is a really important mm -hmm. one. It always, again, boggles my mind when parents say, oh, you should be out and about doing this thing. And it's like, I can't walk anywhere. There's a mm -hmm. highway. I will die. <laughs> like, yeah. you, you can't just go see your friends in a lot of cases. Because mm -hmm. even, um, even our densest cities are just full of really fast cars. And there's, yeah. there's not that many public places to go. So I think it's it's really disingenuous and ignorant to kind of to cry that kids spend too much time on their screens on the one hand and then acknowledge all the infrastructure or problems on the other and say, we're not going to do anything about that. Yeah, it's kind of ridiculous. It's like, <laughs> <sighs> it's frustrating. And it's the same thing when we were saying with the school day, the morning versus the evening, it's like, but where would the kids go in the evening or the morning? And it's like in the solo scene, there'd be spaces. They could go to the library. They could go to their clubs. Perhaps there's a community, like just, Kids could hang out again. I feel like kids can't hang out anymore because of stranger danger and like obviously very valid fear. But as communities are enriched, they become safer. And that's well what we need. Yeah. <laughs> that's all I had for today. Thank you all for listening. I hope you learned something. And I'm going to be trying to break these down into smaller little clips throughout the week on Instagram and on our YouTube. If you are still listening, you can watch us on YouTube, which is pretty fun. See the organism of the week and so on. Our new zine is out, all about education. And that's all. Bye.